Well, at the end of the day, the ultimate currency is probably bullets. Natural Order Podcast, episode 18. Yeah, go Vlad. Go Vlad. Welcome to the Natural Order Podcast with your hosts, Brian O'Leary and Adam Heyman. Natural Order Podcast, back again. Brian O'Leary and Adam Heyman with you. Hello, Brian. Hello. So last couple episodes, we did year in review. And this we had uh, in our mind to maybe do a 2024 prediction episode or kind of get the flavor of what's going on there in culture since it's one of the pillars of our our show. So. Oh, but, yeah. Predictions are easy. I have my yeah. crystal ball. I'm totally ready. <laughs> Yeah, but we uh, we also wanted to talk about Adam launched a new show recently called Heyman Nature, and uh, I just wanted Adam to talk about that a little bit because it kind of, and talk about why it, how why and how it ties into what we're doing here. Oh, thank you very much, Brian. Yep, it's called Heyman Nature. If you if you put that into a YouTube uh, search bar, it should come right up. Um, and you can also check out the Substack for it at HeymanNature substack.com or you could just search uh put in heymannature.com that'll redirect to the same place and yeah i wanted to start a my own show to augment what we do here on natural order just to take a slightly different spin on many of the same issues and also incorporate um, a bunch of interviews that i've been itching to do that haven't really fit into the format for what brian and i do here thus far although we might we might change that in the future. Who the hell knows? Um, so I started a video show, and uh, I hope you fine folk will check it out. It's Heyman Nature. Uh, you can see my smiling face on it. It's it's on video, and uh, it's fun. Right to the, the moment of this recording, there are two episodes out, one on populism and sovereignty and talking about Javier Malay in Argentina and what that portends. And the second one is an interview, or the first half of an interview I did with the great uh, Stefan Kinsella, a libertarian political philosopher and IP lawyer and all-around smart guy. Mm -hmm. It's a great interview. I hope you check it out. Uh, HeymanNature.com, HeymanNature.substack.com, and Heyman Nature on YouTube. Yeah, there we go. All right. And then uh, just to let you folks know, too, that I've got Brian D. O'Leary show that comes out well, regularly, hopefully more regularly as uh, we get into this uh, 2024. And you just go to briandealeary.com there for more. And we'll have links in the show notes for all this stuff too. So uh, don't worry about uh, writing all these things down. We do that for you here at Natural Order uh, Podcast. And you go, of course, to naturalorderpodcast.com for all of that. So, Adam... 2024. Yes, What's it look like? We're already a month in. <laughs> As we're recording now, we're already a month in. Doesn't seem like it, but we are. Looks like uh, wine and roses so yeah. far, right? Yeah. We do have the 2024 presidential cycle. I don't. I wouldn't yes, say we do. it's heating up. Do you? But it's do you have thoughts? Something. I have thoughts. Do you have thoughts? Got thoughts. I mean, I think the Republican nomination, well, Democratic nomination, is all but secure, barring a uh, catastrophic health event for uh, our dear leader, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. Hallowed be thy name. I mean, that is very possible. Guy's in his 80s, and he's not well in the t in the dome, and uh, who knows how his ticker's doing, but uh, either way. Uh, the Republican nomination, Trump's got that more or less locked up, I would say. I, I don't see any evidence to the contrary. And I, I guess... You ask me what I think about it all. It's it's all uh, a comedy of errors as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but but I did see there, there's there's this this poll data and I, I, the Trump camp or Trump himself, you know, famously disavows polls unless they're in his favor. But I saw some polling data not, uh, not too long ago, and they, and they asked this section of people like who they thought was going to win. The election, not who they were going to vote for, but who they thought. And it was like extraordinary. It was, I want to say, uh, 
I don't have I don't have it right in front of me, but it was a it was a twenty or thirty, maybe forty point gap, close close to forty point gap between people that thought Trump would win and people that thought Biden would win. And then there was obviously like the margin of error had uh, you know different candidates and RFK was in there, Haley was in there, but minor percentages. Then I saw a poll this morning, pe- what people actually vote for, and Biden is at 50 and Trump's at 44, <laughs> 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 which seemed to me more realistic as, as far as, you know, at least based on last election, uh, what may or may not have happened, but how the numbers ultimately worked out, so... I don't know. It's confusing. It is a little confusing. And my thoughts on the matter have changed a little bit. I used to think that <clears throat> they would swap out Biden for Newsom here at some point mm. in the process. And that doesn't look like that's happening. So no, I'm Newsom's trying to toxic, figure out man. why. And to answer the question in my own mind, I used my <laughs> my most trusty lens filter on the matter, which is that the deep, we are run by a deep state regime and that who actually is sitting in the chair in the Oval Office doesn't really matter. So I think from that perspective, the regime just needs lackeys. It doesn't really matter who it is. I want someone to keep the spigots of money flowing to the war machine, uh, the bankster machine, all the various corporate interests and other interests that have their snouts firmly in the public trough. And so they don't really, it's, it, I thought they needed to swap out Biden for Newsom just so that the Dems and therefore uh, this iteration of the deep state would have a reliable candidate who was electable because Biden is so old, but they're not well, doing that. So but why? I, I would, I would living in the state where Newsom reigns as monarch. He, <laughs> he is only, electable to the the crazy half of California. There's a half right. of California that's normal, but he'll get the elector- right. he'll get the electoral vote here. The rest of the United States they You're know right. they know who this guy is. He's a he's a snake, he's a scoundrel, he's a bad and guy. And that factor and that factor uh, uh, piles on to my to my theme. I think the way they've solved this problem is they're not going to worry about whether a Democrat or Republican wins. I think they have anointed this viper, Nikki Haley, to Mm. be the agent of the regime on the Republican side. So therefore, they're just going to leave the Biden-Harris ticket alone because obviously Biden will do their bidding and there's no reason to think that Kamala Harris is going to be an independent uh, president uh, fighting back against the the evil corporate interests that run that run the regime, and then they're going to rely on Nikki Haley to uh, make their victory bulletproof. There's just this one very annoying, very large, very popular orange speed bump into that plan, yeah. and his name is Donald Trump, who, as you mentioned, is clearly running away with the nomination, barring some sort of thumb on the scale intervention. Right. And so that means there's a lot you know, of thumbs on that scale right now. <laughs> and we haven't seen them all yet, no. but uh, I mean, yeah, let's run through a few. Yeah. Um, they've tried sporadically in various States, removing him from the ballot. That appears to be failing. Uh, they weaponized the justice department and many state uh, prosecutors against him. Uh, who knows? Maybe they'll end up putting him in jail. It looks ridiculous, but we live in a ridiculous world. They've sick the FBI on him for, eight years Mm -hmm. (laughs) and counting Uh, who knows uh, what machinations will arise from that. And then if all that doesn't work, you know, I don't believe these people are above just JFKing him. Mm. Um, And if that doesn't work, uh, they can always put their thumb on the scale of the opaque election system we have in this country. I don't know if any rigging has occurred, but then again, how would I know? We cannot really audit these things. We had a whole episode that attacked that kind of thing. But Precisely. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's the plan. And the only thing that we've got standing in their way is this doofus, this Trump guy who's mm-hmm. 
It's not like he's good on <laughs> anything. It's not like well, he's not knowledgeable. He just has a few good instincts and a bunch of horrible ones. And he's got the, right. the populist support behind him from people who think they're being screwed correctly. Uh -huh. And for some reason they've, they don't have many saviors. They've chosen this one. Yeah. And like the, the deep state you're talking about hates populism. They hate it. Yeah, Every populist candidate yeah. is pretty much, uh, <laughs> they've, they've, they've gone against them. You know, let's say Richard Nixon was a hugely populist candidate. You're not a conservative. And we talked about this in the past, but he was a, he was a populist man. He, he reached out to the same type of voter that say a large portion of the Trump electorate is. And they, they got him when, you know, a prank gone wrong, essentially Watergate, but we'll, you know, that's for another time. Uh, interesting. You see, the orange guy, uh, Trump, is a is a doofus. On uh, what was that uh, Tuesday, the thirtieth, President Joseph Biden, in his official account, tweeted tweeted this out, or whatever, posted it on on X Twitter, Twitter X, whatever it's called. I now I know how hard it is some days to sweep the clouds away and get to sunnier days. <laughs> our friend Elmo is right. We have to be there for each other, offer our help to a neighbor in need, and above all else, ask for help when we need it. Even though it's hard, you're never alone. <laughs> well, in 2020, we had a good old-fashioned doofus off, and we might get another one. Yeah. Uh, not to say that the sentiment isn't right, but he's, uh, quote, what they call quote tweeting, Elmo, the official Elmo account, or maybe not the official. I don't know. No, no check mark on Elmo, but I only uh, heard about this peripherally. Is I it did true too. that that tweet came out at two thirty a.m. Um, Eastern time? Came out. Was at, he a I, I've very got early this, riser? Got or is that just six, someone on his staff who'd been drinking? Six twenty-six p.m. Whether that's nine twenty-six p.m. Uh, Eastern, I don't know. I don't know what the timestamp is. But he could have he could have tweeted more. This is just one I I found because I was, I'd I'd heard or seen that Elmo was trending, trending. on Twitter, and I was like, Gosh, what, what? Why would Elmo? Apparently, the the president brings him uh, into view. But uh, so like that's not serious. Is my point? That's not that's <laughs> not a serious man. And this is not the this is not <laughs> Joseph Biden himself tweeting this. This is some of his underlings uh, clearly doing his social media. But these aren't serious people. Well, I think it's a payoff to Big Sesame Street. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you gotta you gotta pay off your donors, Brian. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. So all right, I have a yeah, I have so, a non political prediction, okay. so we can sort of we we talk a lot of politics on yeah, the show. Let's yeah. do a let's do a non political you prediction. Bet. Movies, baby. Oh, cinema, the Academy. I'm going to take a real big risk here, and I'm going to predict that the winner. Best picture for this year will be Oppenheimer, which we talked about. Big, last big. Year. I'm really step, sticking my neck out. It's only uh, at betting odds have it at minus nine hundred. Wow. This morning. Wow. So <laughs> you might have to watch that. It's good. You should. Well, I did recently watch the uh, the latest incarnation of Mission Impossible. Oh, I haven't yet. Which, it's a two-parter. I'm waiting for the second yeah, one. Yeah, two-parter. I don't even know if they've started filming, but it's supposed to come out in 2025. But, yeah, I like that franchise. I like it yeah, a lot. Yeah, and it's, I don't know, I've talked about it, I don't know, or written about it, I'm not sure, but the whole idea of, it's, it's not necessarily a great movie, you know, like if you pick it apart, it's not, but it's fun. And that's, it's, it's, fun. An, it's entertainment, and Tom Cruise is not a great actor. But he's a great movie star. And he has to be a great actor, Brian, because he manages to get us all to suspend our disbelief that a midget can be an action hero. Yeah. And he does. Yeah. That's and, acting, my friend. Well, it, That's it, it goes to show. I, mean, I read this uh, book a while back, a few years back, on uh, John Wayne. And John Wayne wasn't a particularly great actor, but he's a great movie star. You and, take that and, back, <laughs> Pilgrim. <laughs> yeah. but, the, but the thing is, John Wayne would only take John Wayne roles. Tom right. Cruise only takes Tom Cruise roles. He got established early enough that that's what he can do. So, and then, you know, like Steve McQueen later in his career, he was, would only take Steve McQueen roles. He was the biggest movie star in the world. Uh, so I think it's interesting that a good movie 
doesn't have you know the the blockbuster type stuff if they have a good movie star it, it can be a terrible movie but people will still see it and, and enjoy it mm, interesting true enough. yeah well i have a i have another political prediction but maybe uh maybe i should give you a, a turn at bat well we talked the presidential election and we got the super bowl coming up here uh week and a half from when we're recording and uh, Taylor Swift is on the front of mind for a lot of folks. And people are, are saying out there like, man, Taylor Swift open her, opens her mouth and she's, she <laughs> can change the, the flavor of the election just as she can the flavor of the NFL season just by being there. Rise, my Swifties, <laughs> rise. First do my of all, bidding. Yeah, first of all, I have to say, I do not at all understand the appeal of Taylor Swift. Uh, I, I'm... I could be mistaken. I do not get it. I, I she's been in the public eye. I think probably for about twenty years or more now. I I've never got it from the beginning. I don't get it now. I don't know a single one of her songs, and I I don't, I don't get the phenomenon. But I'm not plugged into that world, and hopefully my four year old daughter doesn't ever get plugged into that. But we'll see. But I mean, clearly she could do worse. Yeah, clearly she'll be. Uh, in the Biden camp, just her or her demographic certainly is. So she opens her mouth, opens her mouth about anything. There, there's going to be a segment of voters. I don't know how how big it will be, that will just go to the pe- ballot box because Taylor Swift said to, and like you can't do anything about that. Uh, not that I necessarily want to or whatever, but she has that appeal. She's a she's she has her own cult, just like uh, the Trump people have their own cult. Fortunately enough, the Democrats don't have that cult right now with Biden and Harris. There's there's no, no reason no, to that have one, that. That's not very culty. Yeah. But, well, the you've you've buried the lead here, Brian. Okay. Do you believe uh do you believe in the conspiracy theories that her her rise is not organic, her support for the Democrats is not organic. Uh George Soros stepped in and bought her music catalog a while back and that was a weird type of thing for him to invest in. Is that true? I don't put, uh, I, it's what I hear. Oh. I mean, I, I could be wrong, but I, I don't put any stock in these things myself. Um, at least not without more evidence, but I was curious if you had an opinion. No, I, I, I think that, yeah, her probably rise whenever she was a teenager, I think, uh, was relatively organic. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, her, uh, she's a good pop. She writes good pop songs. It's not. It's not exactly what I'm into, but I've though, listened yeah. to a few. They're they're good. I okay. mean, they're they're good. I'm not surprised she's popular. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's just like, but the the whole thing is like, yeah. I don't. I don't know. You know, the conspiracy thing. I'm not saying. But my point is that she can. She's so popular that she can open her mouth and uh, people will do her bidding. Do her bidding. <laughs> just like the the NFL has done to some degree, because like you know they 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 want you now Kansas City was a great. You know they're they're a great team. They've been to the Super Bowl several times in the last few years, but you know her being the girlfriend of the Kelsey guy uh, who plays tight end for him is just another distraction. And if anything, uh, you know it happens in the NBA too. Like you know, there's not like a command that say, "Oh, make the Chiefs win." But if yeah, something is a little, you know, borderline. Well, let's, we'll we'll give it to the Chiefs, just like we uh, give it to the Lakers or the uh, the Bulls or, you know, sure, wh- the star factor, was. the star factor. Yeah, yeah. and it, yeah, it's real. Marginal calls will go Michael Jordan's way. And it's real, and and I've that. I've watched NBA games, playoff games, with former NBA players, and they are scripting this out how this will go, and I. Had to pick my jaw off of the floor the first time, like <laughs> I, you know, somebody pointed out to me that it was real. <laughs> but uh, it's just, it is what it is. The star factor is huge in sports, and it's not just like these elections. It's not totally rigged, unless your name is uh, Scott Foster, or Tim Donny, but uh, in the <laughs> NBA. But uh, yeah, I I think you know calls going one way or another just because they can, and there's no. And, and then, you know, the officials don't necessarily have anything in it other than just like, eh, it'd probably be a little nicer for everybody if, uh, you know. Yeah, I'm Chiefs. with you. And I'll point out that I think the main reason that anti-Dems um, 
conspiracy minded folks on the right, they have their antennae quivering over this issue is because it's weird that she's dating him and it's annoying that he was such a well-known and highly paid proponent of the Pfizer vax yeah, I was gonna say, Mr. on TV Pfizer. commercials over and over and over. And so <laughs> if you uh, <clears throat> swallowed the whole bottle of red pills rather than just the one that was prescribed, you know, you start to see conspiracies everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, it is crazy that, you know, the, the guys, just, well, whatever the whole, the whole Mr. Pfizer thing is, is, I don't, right, well, I don't know. You, you, you stop me. You stop me. Speech. I just can't. I just... <laughs> <laughs> it's, what, it's insane. It's one of my. Uh, that's one of my sub mm-hmm. motivations on yeah. this show, Brian, is to make you speechless. Mm-hmm. Good. So let's move back to politics uh, and the race in the U.S. Senate. Oh. So it currently stands. There's 51 Democratic senators and 49 Republicans, and there are 34 seats up this year. Mm. And of those 34, currently 23 of those are Democrats. So Republicans can take control of the Senate by gaining two seats on that or just one seat and winning the presidency, giving a ostensible Republican the tie-breaking vote in the Senate. Yeah. And I believe that's going to happen. I, I think that the Republicans will take the Senate this year. Okay. Uh, With the normal caveat that elections aren't real and we live in a simulation and who the hell knows this is all worse than a coin flip. It's interesting. I don't I don't know how this works or the algorithm or how much money is getting paid. But I'm, if I'm on my Twitter feed, I almost always see an ad from, is it Jackie Rosen in Nevada, where your, your home state? She's running against a... Uh, unnamed Republican, I guess. And she's complaining that Mitch McConnell is throwing all this money at her, uh, or at her opponent. And I think it's unnamed. I don't, I don't really know. I don't, I don't keep up with it, but all I know is this Jackie Rosen character, uh, is in my Twitter feed all the time complaining and whining about Republicans. She's a Dem- <laughs> you know, clearly a, a, a Democrat here. And it's so funny to see the replies because <laughs> Every like everybody goes after her on on this. It's like just give it up. So I don't know how much money is being sunk into these things by paying Twitter their ad ad fee to you know constantly be in there. But like I I don't know of any other uh, race really right now at this point other than that one in the presidential race. It's interesting. And you you seem to not even have much of an idea on on this. Um, they must have confused your Twitter profile with mine as far as the algorithms okay. and oh, the wow. ad generation. Okay. Um, yeah, I haven't seen any of this complaining um, from Ms. Rosen, and I don't have much to say about her. I do know that the money that gets spent by these Democrats is amazing, and they'll throw it at anything. Like in the, the last election cycle here in Nevada, some of our mostly paper libertarian candidates were having high quality, double-sided glossy ads and lots of them Mm. sent out to everybody in their voting district um, to vote libertarian. Um, And this is all paid for by a democratic pack. Oh really? Just to, yeah, (laughs) to use their, I mean, this is a lever they can pull to try and get, you know, a third party Split to the steal the vote away from a Republican. And this, they spent a lot of money on minor races, you know, How just, magnanimous. Uh, assembly districts, huh? How magnanimous. Yeah, right. It's <laughs> like, Oh, they're, they're for us. They really support our, our philosophy. No, yeah. it's dirty. And, and, you know, I don't normally care because we wouldn't field a candidate if the Republican wasn't equally awful from a yeah. libertarian perspective. I just find it, you know, corrupt and amusing and yeah, they will spend money. Right. So who knows how much they're, how they're paying their heated, hated Elon Musk in order well, to try and move yeah, the needle. I mean, that's an interesting point you bring up because I saw this morning, uh, I'll put it in the show notes here, a tweet that talked about the, the, the filings for the DeSantis pack. I can't remember the name of it right offhand. It's a gone. It's over, right? You know the 
DeSantis well suspended his campaign. I'm not sure it's over, but I I think if I read this correctly, they spent a hundred and thirty million dollars this pack on mm. the campaign to finish a miserable second uh to, yeah. by the time he dropped out. Miserable. And the question is like, what is going on here? Like this pack was uh clearly not on Ron DeSantis's side. <laughs> they were on their own side m- trying to make money off this election, I think. Isn't that, that always the way? That's what it yeah. looks like. Because DeSantis, well, I don't necessarily agree with everything. I think he was the best candidate in this race that we've that we've seen so far. Uh, you know, all things being equal, um, I would have much rather seen DeSantis in there than anybody else, but his messaging got fuzzy. His the people around him were, I think, were giving him terrible advice on like when to go in and when to fight. And Trump just like, you know, bull you, bull in a china shop. Yeah, politics. Yeah, he politic. ragdolled him, and he doesn't. He doesn't That's even he does. care. Like he's like, no, nah. he, he he called DeSantis all kinds of names, Ron De Sanctimonious, De Sanctus, all this stuff constantly, constantly. And then now he's <laughs> like, fine, no. He's just Ron DeSantis to me. He's just Ron. And uh, who knows? He could be the next vice president. And and Trump doesn't care. It's, that's an old school polit- uh, politics with with Trump. And meanwhile, uh, DeSantis and all these other folks around him were trying to play it nice to see if they could appeal to uh, some fantasy of the uh, good portion of Democrats voting for him. It's just not that way anymore. <laughs> we don't we don't live in that world anyway. Yeah, it doesn't seem to happen. We're more polarized than we've ever been. Yeah, clearly. Um, right. um, if you'll allow me, I, I do have another political prediction I want to slip in there. Sure. Yeah, um, let's 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 do that after the break. We'll take a quick break and uh, come back to you. Been thinking about starting that new podcast, of yours? Having trouble figuring out how to do it? Perhaps. Never fear. We were in that same spot a few years back. At O'Leary and Company, we don't have all of it licked. We've gone through the struggles of setting up those podcasts and those side gigs so that you don't have to. And you can go to O'LearyandCompany.com for more details. That's O'LearyandCompany.com. All right, we're back. Natural Order Podcast. And Adam had uh, another political take that he wanted to... uh, Chime in well, on. thanks, Brian, and uh, and Predict. much like with my Oppenheimer as best picture prediction, oh. I'm kind of going out on a limb here. Okay, not sure if you're aware, but in our friendly uh, denizen of the globe neighbor Russia, mm-hmm. um, there is a presidential election this year, and uh, I don't know who you like. There's four candidates uh, that I'm aware of. There's four. Okay, and I don't know uh, if you've heard of this fellow. He's running as an independent. His name is. Putin, 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 mm-hmm. Vladimir Putin. And even though the other candidates look good, uh, a fellow named Nikolay Karitanov running on the Communist Party mm. is opposing him. Also, a fellow named Leonid Shlutsky okay. uh, of the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia. You've heard of that party, Brian. And last but not least, uh, Vladislav Davenkov. Uh, of a melded party, the new party, new people party and the party of growth. Mm. So that's two, two parties for the price of one. And I don't know, even though the field is crowded and competitive, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, and say Putin's going to win. Yeah. I say you read the Cyrillic <laughs> alphabet quite well, if you're able to interpret all that. <laughs> I'm sure I butchered <laughs> all of that. <laughs> yeah. I, what, what was the deal? Um, Put, so Putin was in and then he was out. And then he's been in forever. Did they change the Russian rules or constitution? Or was he prime minister and then became president? Or He's always been in charge. He's always been the head man. Well, remember, they, had, they, they had Medvedev or whatever his name was there for a little bit. They formed a new country out of the corpse of the Soviet sure. Union not that long ago. So I'm pretty sure the rules are still written in pencil, if not right. crayon. Right. They're not They're not trying to stick to a but firm he was, constitution. But he was like literally not the president or prime minister. Or maybe he was one and not the other. One, one had... De, de facto power and one had de jure power. Like, yeah, Putin I'm not always had the de facto speak. power. Right. I'm not knowledgeable enough to speak on this, but my guess is that even when he gave up the presidency, he didn't really give up control. No. He was 
transitioning into a behind the behind the scenes figure and it didn't work out for whatever reason his, his puppet broke the strings or was incompetent or something yeah. so he, Go he muzzled his way back in Go Vlad. Uh, you know, the, I think the reality is that he's, uh, you know, there's four parties, you know, as opposed to these old communist elections where there was one candidate and you still got to vote. At least there's <laughs> four candidates. I, the, the, the thing is, like, he's very popular in his homeland of Russia, I believe. Yeah. I mean, you could easily dismiss this as, you know, propaganda, but I don't think that's the case. I think he is genuinely popular. Yeah, I can't imagine For that. a lot of nationalist type reasons and yeah. he's viewed as tough and competent and smart and if your foil is the idiots in the west well mm -hmm. you probably do look tough and competent and smart right yeah i don't have a ton of horrible things to say about putin but um i don't have a lot of great things to say about him either i mean I know, and, to be a murderer I, yeah he, i mean he's a russian care about things and, like that <laughs> yeah i don't yeah um all right well yeah Putin, we're going to put that, uh, take that to down to your local sports book there in Vegas. Oh, of course, I've got, I've got the the house bet on it. Wouldn't, wouldn't you? Okay. All right. Um, what else you got for us? Wow us with your, your clairvoyance. So, <laughs> funny, I, yeah, I think January twenty sixth came and went. It was the day that we were supposed to be become engulfed in civil war because of the Texas border <laughs> dispute. And it was interesting, you know, it's, it's building up to this heat that, uh, you know, folks like me or you know, probably you, I don't, I'm not going to speak for you right now, but uh, like, yeah, this would be great. This would be great to see how the constitution actually works and see Texas defend itself uh, and kick the feds out because it's Texas property, not federal property on the border and we these people within the state have a right to defend themselves against invaders and clearly the country or state of texas is being invaded by the third world and uh, on the mexican border though as we uh, alluded to a few or last episode of the episode before it's not primarily <laughs> it's not primarily mexicans that are crossing the border I mean, if it were it you know, in, in these cities that they're, they're what we talked about uh, off air, you know, you, you got a lot of border towns in Texas. They they are, well, I don't even know the word, but they're twin cities, essentially, where people work sure. or live back and forth. Uh, Laredo, Texas is one. Nogales, Arizona is another in particular that uh, come to mind. But those are, this is not, these are not what we're talking about. We're talking about this massive third world immigration coming from Asia, Africa, Middle East, uh, that people are somehow getting to Mexico and then crossing the border in, in droves and people from South America traveling through Mexico up to the border. It's crazy. I don't know if you have any more insight sure. on that. Uh, uh, no, we spoke about this a little bit. I, I'll note that it doesn't seem organic and, I don't know about the individual people who are coming, but the the plot to move them here doesn't. It, it seems nefarious. And beyond that, I'll I'll say that state governments, like all governments, can be tyrannical and oppressive. And I'm not on their side in general. Certainly not vis-a-vis -vis private institutions and individuals. But we have a federal system in this country, and. In 2024, the federal government has become a bloated, monstrous, monstrous, oppressive leviathan, and therefore I am thrilled that states' rights is rearing its head as a concept, nullification is rearing its head as an idea, the history of it, interposition. I'm thrilled that the state is flouting laws on uh, guns, on drugs. Um, I don't agree with the sanctuary city uh, ethos, but I'm glad to see smaller polities interposing themselves against the federal government. That's simply because I think the federal government has gone, is, is just poisonously large and evil and oppresses us at every turn. So yeah. I would, I would, I have a I, I would agree with the opinion about, you know, I have a nuanced opinion about immigration, but I, I'm very, very, very glad that Texas and these other, however many 20 some states that have signed on in support of them 
is saying, you know, your policy isn't popular and it's not what we want and to hell with you. We, we want our borders protected. You're not doing the job as is you're not even following the law of the land. So we're going to do something about it. Yeah. And I agree and with the sen- mean- I agree with the sentiment sentiment here. The problem is, I think it's one of Tom Woods's laws. It's like at the end of the day, people don't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> So nothing That's happened. True. They're not doing anything different. This is supposed to like coalesce into Texas, like standing up for itself. And they just kind of just withered away and buckled and like it's, it's status quo ante. So this is a prediction episode, Brian. Is, are you admitting that you had predicted civil war? And No, I didn't. And, I never predicted civil war. Or? I, I was, I kind of got my hopes up, but as uh, I think Spengler says, Optimism is cowardice. So mm. I don't want to be a coward there and be particularly optimistic on this, um, on that front. <laughs> yeah, it makes me wonder. Uh, and not, I, I'm not rooting I for if... war, but I, I agree. I, I'm rooting for the principle of just splitting this up and not in a physical war. But I think to be optimistic about that it, at this point with the people involved, I got my hopes up too much and uh, they, they always let you down. Did a, I mean, did that huge convoy make it down to the border and did anything happen? I'm sorry. I wasn't watching. I, I was so worried that it was going to turn into a huge honeypot, you know, like a J six yeah. trap where, I, well, I think that's what it would just hope that some right wing lunatics would do something insane and kill somebody. And, you know, and, may, have a and new... maybe that's why it kind of, you know, fizzled out or, uh, Right. demurred in some respect it, it, it because if people got wise to it, it's like oh i'm just gonna be falsely accused of doing something even if i was in you know the vicinity uh like, yeah and you're really not going to protect the border with your big rig you can't i mean that's not well, what, <laughs> this what is we, just for show what was the, the minute men back in the old yeah. tea party days they had standing guard and like yeah. that didn't really do a whole lot i mean you you, you run into a whole lot of uh humanitarian i mean what if what if some guy's just crossing the border he just wants to see his family just like one guy and it's like are you gonna like shoot him or are you gonna yeah. like what are you gonna go arrest arrest some guy across no the problem is like this <laughs> these thousands of people at a time just like busting through and then then they scatter up to you know whatever city in the rest of the united states no wonder all these other governors are standing uh, uh, with texas it's cause, like all these people just like we don't have room for it. And another interesting thing is with all the Well, we do have room for them. That's not true. What well, we don't have is room for them plus this massive idiotic welfare state. True. Yeah. And and obviously there's a voting component to this too. There's really no yeah. reason. I don't I don't believe that the government should be prohibiting the movement of people, but there's no reason you should be able to cross a border and vote yourself some of my stuff. That's obviously unjust. So again, this isn't an immigration show, and my opinion on this is is much more nuanced than you ordinarily hear on the TV. But right, yeah, I don't think those Minutemen guys were yeah so, were a good idea. I hope that was mostly for show. I hope they didn't shoot anybody. Yeah. Protect your own private property, you know. Right. Yeah, and I, I think so. The whole point of I guess bringing this up is that I just I I was thinking that yeah we could be like election year something's really going to heat up and. This might be, you know, something to think about for every American, but I just don't, I think it's just going to be washed out in the news cycle real soon. I really do. And uh, we're just going to let things go on, let let Biden do whatever he wants and let um, let this thing happen. I, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Hopefully I am wrong because uh, I don't want, optimism is cowardice. So I don't want to be too optimistic. <laughs> So I was tempted to make a prediction about the economy. Okay. Um, but as we mentioned in the show where we talked about Austrian economics, you can sort of tell what would happen, ceteris paribus, you know, using these these tools and insights, but predicting timing of things right. is impossible. And all this monetary inflation is obviously causing price inflation, all else equal, it has to. But I am frankly astonished that it hasn't obliterated the currency and crashed our economy yet, which means I guess there are, I mean, we keep getting more productive despite all the horrible 
you know, the PC revolution made us productive. The internet made us productive. AI is making us much more productive. We're learning how to uh, transport goods and run retail, you know, much more efficiently thanks to Walmart first. And then, and then Jeff Bezos and Amazon. And so I don't know, we keep innovating. And I think that's the only thing saving us because, oh my Lord, the monetary inflation is bad and it shows all the signs of getting worse. Nobody cares about it. Mm -hmm. And people used to be shocked about the size of the, the Fed's balance sheet or the deficit, and uh, not anymore. Yeah, I, yeah, timing. Yeah, like you, like you said, timing, timing the crash is a fool's errand. I, I tried. You know, I, I was kind of doing some work a number of years ago, t trying to you know figure out you know looking at you know financial data from and the economic data from years past trying to predict uh, when this next cycle or trough or uh would happen and having a bit of austrian background i'm like yeah i this i i see a lot of this happening but like again you can't exactly time it because nobody else necessarily thinks that way and their motivations are different and when I when I think about that, and, and you, you say like, how could it not have cra like how could the economy not have crashed? Well, the U.S. dollar is the strongest currency out there, um, or the U.S. economy it holds props that up in many ways, or the U.S. empire. I did a a podcast with Jason Purcell. Uh, it's a three part podcast. The third one, sh as you're listening, to this should be uh, released right about the same time we get this one out but it's we, we have a three-part podcast where he debunks the whole traditional idea of the petrodollar as it were and it's interesting to go through that and you could just go to briandealeary.com for for more on there or just search my brian d o'leary show on your podcatcher and and uh listen to listen to that with uh show with jason but the interesting thing is it is this the the u.s dollar is not this oil dollar this petrodollar it it is propped up by debt. It is propped up by debt. It's so bizarre. It's so bizarre how this all works. But we, we walk we walk through it, and I, I'm just like confounded how this works. But and it is the strongest currency out there. So of course it's afloat. <laughs> like it's just so. It's gonna crash, and when it crashes, it's gonna crash horribly. But right now, like everybody's scared. It seems like, or all these other countries are scared that they can't compete with the U.S. dollar with hard currency or whatever, because this isn't the way things have gone in the post, you know, New Deal era or New Deal on. So era. here's a question. Yeah, I I don't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not increases in productivity that are saving the dollar, if it is, as you say, that the U.S. dollar is bad, okay, but compared to what? And all right. these other central bank currencies are just as fraudulent and inflated and corrupt and evil. If not more. But if that's true, is it the case that if the collapse, when it, the inevitable collapse when it happens and our currency crashes, when that happens, does that mean that all currencies will collapse? Or will it be localized to just us Could and our biggest well, trading partners? Maybe the, maybe the central bank currencies backed by debt now if they have commodity backed uh currencies perhaps or metal backed currencies who knows but they do, they don't it's all it might be a dead cat bounce for everybody you know <laughs> like, just it just drops and then we're back at a lower level for for everything i, I don't know who knows smack 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 well at the end of the day <laughs> the ultimate currency is probably bullets yeah brass uh so i don't know do you have any do you have any more predictions well i mean along that line i mean i wasn't planning on talking about it a whole lot but um you know there there is bitcoin and I, i'm not i'm not huge in the whole bitcoin infrastructure bitcoin world but i had i, I did on my aforementioned other podcast brian dealer show i had uh, wesley schlemmer on he talked about building uh, wealth with Bitcoin and using Bitcoin within a circular economy. And uh, they're doing a very good job of it down in Tampa, Florida. At least it's starting small and, and probably this episode will be out after they have it, but they have the, their big launch of Bitcoin Bay uh, this weekend, uh, February 2nd or 3rd, 2nd or 3rd, something like that. Um, yeah. Wesley's great. I, I wish him and his efforts well. And mm -hmm. I don't have any particular opinion about Bitcoin except 
since it is trying to be a competing currency to fiat, I, I wish them well. Um, True. Yeah, but I, you, I, I would also I, wanted... I would also recommend here, sorry, Adam, to interrupt, but if you listen to this show on fountain.fm, you can earn Bitcoin while right. listening. And uh, we'll have the link if you want to sign up. We'll have the link in the show notes there. And you, you don't earn a, a ton. It's in the form of Satoshi's over the Lightning Network. you got to learn about Bitcoin, but go back to a previous episode I had with Wesley where you, I say, walk, walk, walk. Wesley, walk me through it like I'm seven. Because that's what I think a lot of us need to know. But uh, but anyway, yeah, and then that can support this show and support yourself at the same time. It's kind of wonderful how it all works. But um, anyway, continue, my friend. Oh, absolutely. Um, all good advice. Um, my next prediction is more of a trend. I mean, we've already seen this happen. But did you see, you know, Javier Millet gave a great speech mm -hmm. at the World Economic Forum here recently. Did you see the AI created English translation of that speech. Oh, I probably did because I was like, "How the how the heck is this guy?" Yeah, he does not English? know English. That's what I thought. Um, but I and like, that, yet that you can go on and watch a video English of English him for a guy that was maybe doesn't no, even speak that, it. That's a computer, but yeah. it's got his voice, it's got his accent, and mm -hmm. it's manipulated the face and the head and the mouth to form English words in time with the AI generated English speech. I think, I think it's your, incredible. I think your and, friend Bob Murphy did that with one of his episodes into Spanish. He did yeah. in Spanish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I just wanted to point that out and say, you know, we've already seen deep fakes and my prediction for this year is we're going to see some super sinister deep fakes that will cause a move in public opinion in one direction or another. And I don't know enough about the tech to know how well those can be debunked or spotted. Yeah, but we are we live in a video. I mean, we used to say a picture is worth a thousand words, right? And people just believe videos when they see them. And I, if you can make such a good deep fake, well, yeah, I mean, you can show a video of Donald Trump. Well, I heard a, I heard a great somebody. Donald Trump uh, country song the other day. I think it was a <laughs> AI yeah, voice I've heard a with few. his accent. I've heard it's a like, few. Uh, or no, it, some, no, it might have been a rap. I can't remember what it was. Some genre uh, music, but. Uh, yeah. I have a white pill for it too, and okay. which is that as dangerous as deep fakes are um, and how we need to keep on our toes, I think what's going to end up happening is people are going to be less gullible. Hmm. Once it becomes more, much more known how easily you can be faked, uh, tricked, I think people just won't automatically believe the thing they see scrolling through the social media. Well, the we've been pretty goddamn gullible for a long time. The best tell right now is to look at the fingers or look at the hands. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, they'll know, figure out how to do fingers hands eventually. or six fingers or whatever. But interestingly, you say that about the deep fakes. There's a guy, I haven't seen him. It's on Instagram or Twitter or something like that. But he, he's been doing this deep fake thing um, as Tom Cruise, the aforementioned Tom Cruise. Uh, I saw that. For a long yeah. time. And he, he, you know, his, he looks vaguely like Tom Cruise, but maybe some of the, the facial structures, the hairline, maybe vaguely the same, but he can, they can transform him into Tom Cruise and he does all this crazy stuff like Tom Cruise doing normal things and people not do anything. Cause you can't, <laughs> but anyway, that, so that company, I think that, um, that does all this deep fake, they, they also did a, a deal on, I want to say it's America's Got Talent, the the show on NBC, where they had a guy up on stage. And obviously, like, if you're in the crowd, you can't really see, but they had on the giant monitors, this guy's Elvis from, like, 1957. And he his his voice, so his voice sounds very much like early days Elvis. So he was doing the singing, but they were deep faking up on the monitors, Oh, wow. And then they had this all the, and then, you know, you see Simon Cowell's jaw drop, like how the heck is this possible? Then they one upped it and then they did something where, uh, Simon, they deep faked Simon Cowell's head <laughs> singing something. Or else, and he's sitting there in the stands. He's not singing. He's just <laughs> looking at this like puzzled and like, all right, move on to the next round, pal <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, things are getting weird. So, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting time in which we live. Now, let me give you one more before we wrap, because it's super brief. All right. Javier Malay 
won the presidency oh, in yeah. Argentina by running not only as a libertarian or libertarian leaning, but as a radical anarcho capitalist libertarian, citing Milton Friedman and Murray Rothbard and F.A. Hayek. And mm -hmm. um, it's much less of a victory size wise, but um, a woman in, in Kansas, uh, Wichita, Kansas, won the mayoral race. And she's not a pure libertarian, but when asked in, a, in this nonpartisan race, she said her political philosophy is, li is a libertarian one. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was hit and miss on exactly understanding what that political philosophy is. But my point being, as, uh, as people in our camp used to say 50 years ago, you know, you could name all the libertarians in the country on you know, two hands and two feet. Right. And, and now the movement is much, 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 much bigger, um, comprised of many very powerful and influential voices, of which we are too. And you can win sometimes large uh, political office by openly espousing libertarian political principles. And I think that's a encouraging trend. And I will cautiously uh, predict that that, that that trend continues in, in some way or another, maybe not in the libertarian party, although maybe. But it, we're we're rubbing off on other parties. Our ideas yeah. are a, a nice, healthy virus. Not the and, Democrats and they're, too much. It could be. It depends. Yeah. I mean, what if the, the the pendulum swings, right? What if the next version of authoritarianism is right wing? Mm -hmm. You know, California wanted to secede when Donald Trump was elected. Political right. decentralization. What? Hey, what? They've been nullifying drug laws. Yeah. That's pretty well, it's interesting to me, idea. like from from my from my end, more right wing type of guy, uh, with like a lot of libertarian sympathies. But my probably my favorite two politicians or in the Senate and the House anyway right now would be uh, Thomas Massey for sure and Rand Paul, which they would espouse themselves as libertarians. But they, they the Venn diagram from my beliefs, you know, whether you agree with them every jot and tittle, like. Yes, I want all. Of, I want those guys in every position across the board. Be, you know, even if I they're not going to go like full full on where I want to go, it's a major step and it's a major transformation from the status quo, the Nikki Haley types, which are oh, it's God. just insane yeah. that people will uh, vote in Lindsey Grant. I mean, South Carolina, which is like a wonderful place. But they they have some insane people um, as it, uh, over the years as their political people. I mean, you know, right now, like Lindsey Graham and Nikki Haley is their most notable uh, folks, and they they're just treacherous human beings. And um, anyway, uh, yeah, more Thomas Massey's and Rand Pauls uh, in there, and uh, you know, I I don't know, I don't I don't see those guys as uh, ever. <laughs> right now anyway like it's uh, like optimism is caritas once again but yeah th those guys uh, if they were ever to run for president in a real form they're just going to get killed just like ran paul's father ron, ron paul like he was by far the best candidate but he just got no love from the deep state as you call it and you know just washed out but uh, i've got well uh... i've got my ron paul buttons i've got my ron paul books i've got i you know he's by far the most uh influential uh, presidential candidate in the last uh, what? Well, here's another white pill. I yeah. don't want to make you a coward or anything, yeah, but please. In the Ron Paul runs, they use the devious machinations of the RNC to to screw with him. Mm -hmm. But the biggest thing they use to screw with him is controlling public opinion by having a vice grip on the media, controlling well, the those organs, and that control is shattering now. People are no longer getting all their news from these decrepit old institutions. No, but it's still there. It's still there enough. Voices. And certainly in 2020, it was loud and clear. Like, loud and clear. I'm just saying it's shattering. It's it, cracking. It is. It is. And I, I think that's good. And I think maybe uh, we need to start our own TV network, but uh, cart before the horse here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Before, before I'll, you, but yeah, I'll I, I agree. For a contract I contract on one of the others. Yeah, I, I agree with you that uh, the media has a has a is, is shattering. But again, they have a stranglehold on opinion of people that are probably, you know, a good block of people that are older than we are. Let's say, and w whether their in the influence is 
outpacing the maybe the actual numbers, uh, if that makes sense. I, w- I, would, I would go as far as saying you see some of these Twitter accounts, 60 Minutes was one for as popular as 60 Minutes supposedly is, or like it was in the cultural zeitgeist you're, you know, for years, for decades. They get moderate amounts of like, like a normal, like, guy could get more likes and views than the 60 minutes account which is just strange to me that people don't care about that stuff now but whatever they say will then get trumpeted out to all these other you know, so you eventually hear it <laughs> that's my point you might not hear it from the horse's mouth but you eventually hear that over well it used to be the case that you'd get lied to by the mainstream media mm-hmm. and you'd know it and you wouldn't have any other choices. So right. you'd listen to them again. That's not the case anymore. It's true. And as people slowly start to wake up to the fact that, oh, yeah, these people are just trying to manipulate me. They're telling me outright falsehoods. Um, now they do have options. And that trend can only continue until, I don't know, they weaponize the FEC to make folks like you and me illegal. But uh, yeah. I don't think it's. I don't think that's going to happen. I think that we're winning the information battle. And then we're going to win the ideological battle. And then maybe we can live free and peaceful and prosperous. Coward. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I will, uh, we'll leave it at that for today and, uh, maybe get back to future predictions here, uh, down the road. But uh, we just want to wrap up. Uh, I want to wrap up by saying, go check out Adam's new show, Heyman nature. Uh, and then we'll have links to that in the show notes. And then my show, the Brian D O'Leary show, where you can find on uh, every podcatcher also, and we'll have links for that in the show notes. Uh, any, any last words from you, Adam? Uh, no, except a uh, great show, Brian. And thanks everybody for listening. Yeah. Thanks guys. And uh, natural order podcast where you go and we'll chat with you down the line. Good day. For more, head on over to naturalorderpodcast.com. Show notes for today's episode can be found at naturalorderpodcast.com slash ep18. That's naturalorderpodcast.com slash ep18. And don't forget to check out Heyman Nature on YouTube and HeymanNature.com. And also head on over to BrianTOleary.com where you can find new episodes, old episodes, archive of The Brian D. O'Leary Show, and more. Thanks again.